Chapter 14 provides interesting points for our discussion. So why do people think that you have to have a writing to validate a contract? I think it's because of what they hear on television. Most of us have wrongly learned from television shows about the requirements for the form of a contract. Many watch Judge Judy or Judge Whomever and do not realize that those are not real judges. So let's pop a bubble here, which is that they're actors. And maybe that individual was a judge for a day or week or a temporary judge, but indeed on television they are simply actors. They do serve legally as arbitrators. The parties who are before them do have real cases that they forwent or they have foregone in real course courts all across the United States. And basically these parties have placed their real cases before the fake courts on TV in an arbitration setting. And so by going by 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 contract they go into arbitration and the arbitrator who is the judge impersonator the fake judge uh, that they limit themselves to just the contestants' earnings, which is typically $2,500 per individual. The arbitrator then is limited to that total of combined $5,000 to split. You actually, you never see any decision by the so-called judge, the actor, or the arbitrator of more than $5,000. Thus, the real parties have contractually agreed to let that individual arbitrate before a camera. They gamble only their contestant fees, their earnings, in other words, from their appearance on the show. I'll tell a story here in a minute of a real case, but again, let's pop that bubble. Those aren't real judges. That's not a real courtroom. Those are not real bailiffs. In this chapter, we discuss rules that require some written form. Think about what we've learned so far. The three elements to form a contract, an offer, an acceptance, and consideration. None of these mention a writing. A writing requirement in this chapter is there to preserve certain types of evidence. So turn to slide two and you'll see under the statute of frauds, the types of contracts that fall within the requirement of a writing. Think of the statute of frauds as a statute to prevent fraud by having those contracts in writing. The first two can be grouped into a category of items of large value, things like land, or any time you sell goods of $500 or more. Later in the course, we'll review the sales of goods under the Uniform Commercial Code and come back to the statute of frauds on goods. Right now, nothing we're covering is a goods. Everything will fall under the common law. So for large value transactions, we want to slow the transaction down by putting the agreement in writing to preserve it. There's no reason to move that transaction quickly. Consider buying a can of corn at your lo local grocery store. That, that is a goods item. That will fall under the UCC later. But that sale doesn't need to be in writing, and yet that sale is a contract. When you leave after paying for that item, you walk out owning that can of corn. That's your goods. Remember, later we'll talk about the UCC and the continuation of our discussion of the sta same statute of frauds. Every transaction at a retail grocery store, every, everywhere, at uh, TJ Maxx, at Fred Meyer, at J.C. Penney's, they're all contracts, offer, acceptance, consideration. And very few of those transactions are in writing. And by the way, a cash register receipt is not a writing because it doesn't indicate anything other than the price paid. It doesn't show the agreement or the meeting of the minds. The last two items on slide two, that is contracts involving the one-year rule and contracts that are collateral or secondary, are grouped in another category, a single category. Here, however, 
consider situations where a witness's memory might fade, or there might not be any witness. So in collateral contracts, contracts that are on the side, so to speak, parties enter into a contract often to benefit a third party who would not necessarily be present during that contract's formation. So those contracts must be in writing to be enforced. So let's go back. Why do you think people believe they have to have a writing to validate a contract? Again, because of what they hear on television. And again, it's a bubble we need to pop, a bubble that many live in. I've had several students in my classes who participated in these judge shows in Hollywood. One in particular stood out. She said that she had a dispute with her ex-husband over a local matter, some minor issues. Her lawsuit was local in a small claims court, but the producers in Hollywood found her case and asked them if the couple, the ex-husband, and she wanted to come to Hollywood. She agreed, and so the Hollywood producers put up her airfare as well as her ex, as her opponent's uh, airfare. They paid for the hotel, the food, and early in the morning, the show's limousine service picked her up, brought her to the studio to begin filming. The audience was paid actors, extras. Before the fake judge in that studio, she began to testify, and when the director yelled, cut, and said, excuse me, but this time, would you go back into your discussion, but be a little more upset, be a little more angry? She did. She went back into her testimony, her discussion, and did try to put on more of that acting face. A couple of hours later of filming, she's trying to finish up, and the director again yelled, cut. He said, can you go back and this time say the same thing, but perhaps can you cry? And so she did. The whole day lasted 17 hours. Well, they flew her back to where she was from originally, and she waited for her fame to appear on television. Eventually, after weeks of waiting, she called the producers and said, you know, I thought this was going to be on television. I thought I would have my little 15 minutes of fame. And the producer replied, well, we looked at the show, we looked at everything in the editing room, that you and your ex-husband did with our director. And frankly, to be very honest, you weren't entertaining. We're just not going to run your show. So that true story illustrates or underscores that this type of bubble exists as entertainment. They're not reality. They're not judges. They're not anything that people, especially in business, can trust. But the problem is this, television does a very good job at teaching, and it does a very good job of teaching even misinformation. And what we'll learn from those shows, and we hear it often, is you have to get it in writing. You should have got it in writing. As a matter of fact, often, if, if there's a dispute of this nature, you'll hear an interviewer out onto a street setting talking to people who watch the show, and he'll ask them, what the parties should have done differently, and they'll all respond by saying, well, the parties should have got it in writing. And somehow, as viewers, we have wrongly interpreted that discussion, that point, as a matter of law, that contracts have to be in writing, and they don't. Let's remove this garbage from our brains. Let's, let's review it as a different mantra. A, a mantra. Uh, let's look at slide two and repeat. All contracts, whether in writing or not, are enforceable. And just stop there. Consider what you've said. All contracts, whether in writing or not, are enforceable. But now let's finish. Let's repeat. All contracts, whether in writing or not, are enforceable, except for those listed here, the four on that slide. In fact, there's only a few areas where contracts have to be in writing to be valid. Writing does not somehow make it more legally important. What writing does is just secures the evidence. It makes the evidence more permanent. 
but anyone can go into court and provide oral testimony on a contract. What you remember, what you've heard, all that can be presented as your evidence. Trustable, trustworthy, reliable evidence, evidence that probes into the question. It doesn't have to be in writing unless it's what? On slide two.